Hello. I think it must be because it's a dark day. Looks to me like this video is a little dark. I suppose someday I will invest in the proper lighting to make a video and the proper background too. Um, I was outdoors, even though it is dark, it wasn't raining, so I went there. And we spent a little time with Psalm 2, one of the royal psalms, thinking about hope, because this is the Advent season. We'll come to that in a couple, maybe three weeks. I think we have three more books of the Bible. We have Peter today, John's letters next week. And Revelation after that. So yes, we are coming down to this long stretch, the final stretch. We have two great big events this week. Before I see you again on here, we will have done two of our large events. Um, so keep praying for us that God bless. The first one is the one done by the city or the community association. And we just do some parts of it. We give away food and I get to tell the Christmas story and we give away books and Bibles. So um, pray for us on that. We serve around 350 children for this. And then on Wednesday, you know, Thursday is the walk through Bethlehem, which, oh yes, the, the hope, is 500 children. Um, I don't want to let my doubt uh, color. God can bring 500 children, but I'm not sure we have uh, put out enough invitations for that. So just pray that the people who come, the people who should, will come. Um, so we're working with Peter today, Peter's letters. And so before we read, let's pray. Lord God in heaven, I ask that you will strengthen my voice. Keep me from having to cough while we spend a few minutes with Peter coming back after his, um, well, coming back to to write he didn't write part of the other but he had so much influence and so now we we want to listen to him and we ask that you will guide us help us to understand in jesus name amen well first we're going to read from the letters of peter we are going to connect first peter Second Peter and Jude. They go together. You'll hear. First Peter 1, 10 and 11, and then 23 to 25. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of humans as the flower of grass, the grass withers, and the flower fades away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. Second Peter 1 verse 4 and then 16 and 21. 16 to 21. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received from God the Father, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of humans, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, and then 10 through 14. This second epistle, beloved, now I write to you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly humans. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein will be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And here is Jude. Jude 1, verses 24. Oh, I'm going to read 5 through 7. And then 24 and 25. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has, has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.
We're preaching through the Bible in a year. We have come to some of the very smallest books in the New Testament. These are letters written to the general church and known by the name of the author rather than by that of the addressees. We will look at Peter and Jude today. Jude warned about heretics coming in the church and Peter used the same material, but to support his own theme of the value and verity of the scriptures. Since Peter wrote in highly polished Greek, we think his audience was at least a literate society. For Peter, there was no calm middle of the road. Earlier with Jesus, he got the answer right and profoundly right, and then he got his advice giving all wrong. Later, Peter knew he was the most loyal, and then he left the scene with oaths of disloyalty. Today, we get to consider Peter's comebacks. Second Peter. Well, really, this second letter is considered by some not to have been written by Peter, but by a follower, reviving his mem memory and using his authority. I'm not much content with that because of Peter's claim in our reading to have been eyewitness to the life of Jesus. So we will read today as if it really was Peter who wrote this, as the author intended us to do. In another view, this second letter is seen by some as primarily teaching against internal heresies. I am not much content with that because of the differences between artistry and management, between Eastern mind and Western mind, supposing it was the Apostle Peter who wrote the two letters that go by his name, as the authors apparently wish us to think, then the first one begins with the same theme as the second, but in a manager's voice. The first letter soon diverts into many managerial issues with popular Western ideas of Greek rhetorical devices, lists of how to live rightly, and even a table of household relationships in family and in church. So later, perhaps Peter decided to go again with his primary theme, but this time to a larger audience, written with broader strokes in the voice of an artist with the Eastern mindset fed by the Old Testament scriptures. Perhaps Peter was so struck by awe there on the mountain where he saw Jesus transfigured before him that he needed to stand back and broaden his skill to use stentorian language and large art. The errors he cites in just as broad strokes are merely side excursions to the main theme. And Second Peter keeps them in their place, always coming back to the main theme. Peter wrote about the difference between cleverly devised myths and eyewitness stories. What is this theme that it might seem Peter wanted to keep on resurrecting? It is in our text today and spread all over the book. First, let's observe Peter's first try. In 1 Peter 1, 10 to 13 and 23 to 25, he painted for his readers a picture of the grass, perhaps the most surviving and persistent kind of plant on earth. And then he said, the Bible will last longer. He called it the word, the good news in which both the ancient prophets and the current apostles share. This could be called the aborted theme of First Peter, setting the stage for Second Peter. We're discovering the theme of Second Peter. Another clue lies in Second Peter 1.4 the delighted mention of the great and precious promises whereby we may escape what troubles us and become partakers of the divine nature. This is not only for the parousia, the second coming, whereby a new and beautiful country will come to pass. This is for us now to envision that beautiful country so we can imitate it here and now. Partake of the divine nature through the promises. 
The primary clue to the theme of 2 Peter lies in 2 Peter 3, 1 to 2. Peter himself told the purpose of this letter to remind his readers to remember what was spoken to us by the past prophets and the more recent apostles. The purpose of 2 Peter is not to rail on error, not to roust out rowdies, not to make lists of heresies. The purpose of 2 Peter is to get his hearers and us to read the Bible. Peter claimed in no uncertain terms that the Bible is not cleverly devised myths. The Bible is not propaganda to pull a nation together 400 years before Christ. Founding myths and shaping stories are fine tools that God can use. But Peter's statement is that these were not made by the will of humans. These were not created for human purposes. They are not Clever, cunning, sly, or undercover organizing, Peter claimed unassailably that he himself was eyewitness of Jesus' glory and majesty, specifically recalling Jesus' transfiguration and the voice from heaven. We have not cleverly devised myths, but eyewitness stories. So read the Bible, says Peter. Peter wrote about the difference between human invention and scripture, more surely confirmed. Peter then moved on to extrapolate from his experience to the experience of the ancient prophets. Since his experience was real and his story true, then he could certainly imagine how the prophets spoke and wrote. He used his own experience to certify the verity of the Old Testament scriptures. He cited the actual presence of Jesus the King and the voice from heaven as proof that the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Christ are from God. He even recalled the image of lamp and light from Psalm 119, 105 to say that the Bible will light your path in the dark and bring you to Jesus as the morning star arising in your heart. The Bible will do all that and therefore read the Bible. But there is a presupposition, something that is assumed before you start reading the Bible. Peter wrote, first of all, you must understand this. Actually, in this second letter from Peter, we can find two presuppositions. This one in 2 Peter 1.20 and another in 2 Peter 3.3. 3. So let's examine the recommended presuppositions. First, Peter said one must understand that the Bible cannot be interpreted by humans alone. The first required assumption is that the Bible needs to be read by several Christians together. And in consideration of the several parts of scripture and with the help of the Holy Spirit who inspired them, do we see now why I believe Peter's primary theme in 2 Peter is read the Bible? Presupposition number two is that scoffers will say there is no second coming of Jesus, that nature has always run its course with no interference from a supernatural source. This, then, is the heresy the batch of internal error whose refutation was the side effect of Peter's primary theme. It is to be assumed while reading the Bible that there are some who willingly ignore the ideas of a creation by the word of God and of a flood which overflowed the world by the word of God and of a coming judgment by the same word of God. Apparently, out of this well-chosen ignorance grows all the human evils and lusts and lies, riots and bigotry, pollution and slavery. From Second Peter 2. 
Therefore, to summarize Peter's work in the second letter attributed to him, we could understand that reading the Bible, believing its stories, and doing this together will help people to discern and stand firm through troubles. The answer for surviving and thriving in the midst of error and heresy lies in reading the Bible and doing this together. The answer for our churches to survive and thrive in the midst of apathy and exhaustion lies in reading the Bible and doing this together. Will you choose reading the Bible? So I have a couple questions for you to think about. Number one, make a quick scan and count the times Peter uses the word hope. What do you find hopeful about this letter? Number two, when you pass the midpoint in travel, do you say we're halfway there or we now have as far to go as we've come? What do you think Peter would say? What about Jude? Fun to think about. Now I want to pray with you. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray with me, please. Lord God in heaven, we grant you this power in your word. We are grateful that you have brought us your word and filled it with yourself. And so we ask that you will give us the joy of reading your word, that you will make it wonderful every time any one of us looks at it we thank you for peter and for his staunch support of your word and we ask that you will keep us remembering your word i know i have way too often let other things come in my day without time in your word <clears throat> the day is always worse after i miss that but i do so i'm asking your forgiveness and i'm suggesting that everyone who's coming to you right now and asking your forgiveness for putting something in place of the bible i ask you to hear them hear us forgive us grant us close view of you once again let us walk with you In the joy of that forgiveness, we, we turn to those things that are hurting us in this world. There are many people hungry and in danger because of sanitation issues. Somehow I, I can't comprehend it all, but you know it and you know how to help. We ask for your help with every person um, struggling with something. I ask that you will please bless our children, bless our families, grant us the resources we need in the future that will make us happy and fulfilled in you. Grant us ways to be together and to help each other. Please stand in those places where war or disaster has struck and we thank you we will honor and glorify you always for what you have done for exactly what you are beginning right now today we thank you and honor and glorify you in jesus name amen Well, I'm Wilma Zalabach, and I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship.
the a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity and yes i have six themes that usually come up that is god is good humans have been taken away from god and good jesus came to bring us back and i can't do it but god can and i decide to let him two more the bible is worth reading and the sabbath is a gift worth remembering so until next week I see you again in the letters of John. May, may the Lord bless you and keep you.